All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for uh, another uh, special interest group for the the Caspian RNA puzzles um, RNA special interest group for 3D structure um, announcements. We're going to have a, a normal schedule up until winter break. Um, so in two weeks, we're going to have Kathy Lawson talk about um, the nucleic acid knowledge base. Um, so we'll see you guys back again in, in two weeks for that talk. Um, today, we're going to have um, the wonderful Carissa Sambomatusu. Hopefully got that somewhat okay. My apologies, Carissa. Um, talk about uh, molecular simulations of RNA and RNA protein complexes. Um, uh, Carissa is a fellow at uh, Los Alamos National Lab um, in New Mexico. Um, she has led a group there since 2001. Um, she did her uh, BA in Columbia University in New York uh, and her PhD in Colorado and Boulder. Um, she's been using computational and experimental approaches to understand a diverse range of, of non-coding RNA systems, um, including chromatin, the ribosomes, riboswitches, long non-coding RNAs. So um, lots that uh, the predictors, lots of RNAs uh, that may be familiar to uh, predictors even. Um, and she's a fellow of the American Physical Society um, and an advocate for LGBTQ plus scientists um, across the world. Um, she also has a wonderful TED talk um, about the biology of gender um, that I highly recommend anyone uh, viewing um, if they have not done so already. Um, all right, over to you, Carissa. Okay, well, thank you so much for um, inviting me to the RNA puzzles and CASP community. It's um, an honor to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, molecular simulations of RNA systems and also RNA protein systems and what we're doing to look at mechanism and also uh, what we're doing to work with uh, cryo-EM data. Uh, so first I will talk about uh, explicit solvent molecular dynamic simulation. So it's full-blown simulations with water and ions and electrostatics. Uh, then I'll talk about a method we've been uh, developing since about 2010 or so um, to do native contact simulations. And we we have now incorporated electrostatics and magnesium ions in those, and those allow us to access uh, 10 to 100 millisecond uh, timescales, but still uh, maintain good stereochemistry and, and atomistic detail. And then finally, I will talk about uh, using those native contact potentials uh, to fit cryo-EM maps. And uh, I didn't put this in the talk, but but the, the latest thing we're doing those is to interpret weak density by sampling a lot. Okay. Okay, so first I will do uh, explicit solvent simulations. Uh, so many of you have seen these kinds of uh, force fields. The reason I'm putting up this slide and the potential is that to contrast it when I go over the native contact uh, potential, uh, it's, it's parallel to this, but with some important differences. So as everyone knows, we have our typical bond angle, dihedral, Leonard-Jones, and uh, Coulomb uh, terms. And I wanted to highlight our um, ion uh, equilibration protocol that we've been using since about 2009. Uh, and this works quite well with even the old Amber 99 force field. We get rock solid riboswitch and ribosome trajectories with that, as well as the latest uh, for example, amber force fields uh, uh, developed by Tom Cheatham for, for RNA. Uh, and so what we do is we're very careful uh, to try to emulate a realistic ion environment, uh, meaning the ion cloud um, surrounding the RNA system. And when you quote an experimental value of ion concentration, typically people are measuring or quoting values in the bulk, but of course we know the ions condense around the RNA. So it's actually, the, there's a distribution of ion concentrations that depends on space. Uh, so it's usually quite high around the RNA and then it falls off to the bulk value. And uh, what do we do is we have an iterative process where we go through all of these steps over and over again until we can get a nice curve, uh, a distribution of the ion concentration as a function of space as it falls off from the RNA. Um, so the way we do this, 
And we, we started this because when we first started simulating ribosomes back in 2002 or so, uh, in that case, uh, it was hard to get the stable trajectory of RNA of, of the ribosome. Uh, so we had to really work hard to, to um, treat the ions carefully so we could get those stable trajectories and unrestrained systems. Uh, so what we do first is we freeze the solute or the RNA uh, and uh, we use a simple kind of simulation. So eventually we're doing all atom explicit solvent simulations, but as a first step, just to equilibrate the initial structure, uh, we don't use water and we have ions with a artificially large radius to emulate hydration of the ions. Uh, so in that case, we freeze the solute and then we scramble the ions running at very high temperature to get electrostatic equilibrium of the, of the different ion populations. Uh, once we see the electrostatic energy flatten, uh, then uh, we solvate and um, we use SPCE water um, uh, because um, we were influenced by Eric Westhoff's group um, back in, in 2002 or so, and they were doing some of the first explicit solvent simulations of RNA with, with excess ions on, on tRNA. And I got to postdoc um, Andrea Vianna, who's now a sci uh, PI himself, but uh, but he brought the, the the magnesium parameters and the SPCE um, equilibration uh, idea with him out to Los Alamos. So that's how it started. And so uh, we solvate with SPC water. Uh, uh, we freeze the ions and we freeze the RNA and we equilibrate the water uh, first. And then what we do is we uh, freeze the magnesium and then we release the potassium chloride. And then finally we release the magnesium. And then after that, we release the RNA. And then depending on the system by release, what I mean is we have these uh, constrained with harmonic potentials, and then we gradually uh, turn down the potential until it's totally off, the, the harmonic restraint until it's off. And at the same time, uh, we heat the system up to room temperature. And so there's kind of a crossover between the um, harmonic potential going down and the temperature going up. And then finally, you know, after uh, a lot of uh, nanoseconds, it's ready to fly and be free on its own without any restraints at all. Uh, and nowadays we often do a microsecond equilibration because um, times have changed, but in the earlier days we did, you know, 10 to 100 nanosecond uh, equilibration. And, um, and we use this in one of our latest papers in JMB 2022, where we're doing, we're using plumed and metadynamics, but, um, but we have um, the details and in the papers over the years from JMB in 2009 and, and, on, and forward. Uh, so we believe that this is really critical, uh, doing a careful treatment of that. Of course, you can't use counter ions. No one should ever use counter ions. Um, and the reason for that is that if you just only use counter ions with no excess, if an ion falls off, if it flies off the RNA, there's nothing right there to replace it. And then you can get uh, the backbone buckling, you can get all kinds of instability. So, you shouldn't ever use counter ions. Uh, instead, you should populate with a random distribution of ions and then equilibrate the ions. And the, by random distribution, I mean a full box of ions at the proper concentration. And then equilibrate those. And it, we find it works if you freeze the RNA first and then gradually uh, release everything step by step. And even in the RNA for the ribosome, we had a complex protocol to release the RNA where we first uh, release the loops and then the base pairs after that. Uh, basically, the things that you know should be uh, rock solid, we release last. Uh, but then in the end, we have a full unrestrained uh, ribosome system, riboswitch system that's stable on the um, time scales between 1 to 10 microseconds. And we haven't run further than 10 microseconds, so we think it would be stable for longer. OK, so that's on um, equilibration. So as an example, uh, we have a JAX paper in 2012 uh, where we use this protocol. And then we try to use, uh, be, you know, because ion, because RNA is highly charged, we try to use the biggest box that we can. Uh, uh, this is really important also. So, um, and the biggest cutoffs that we can, you know, that you can afford. So we use 15 angstrom uh, cutoff. 
particle mesh evolved. And for the SAM1 ribosome search, we had a 100 cube, 100 angstrom cube system and 100,000 atoms here. We had 20 microseconds for the entire paper added up, but each trajectory here was a few uh, microseconds. And in this particular paper, we were looking at the effect of different magnesium concentrations on the um, dynamics. And then we just looked at uh, the ion density uh, in the grooves and around the backbone. And the main conclusion from this sh uh, short study was that uh, we saw three populations of uh, magnesium ions here. This is SAM1 aftermer RNA. Uh, the magenta molecule is the s methionine ligand bound in the middle. And the green are the magnesiums. And of course, we have water and potassium chloride with periodic bounding conditions as usual. And so uh, toward the corners of the box, we basically have uh, free uh, magnesiums diffusing. And then there's, uh, in this particular RNA, there's only one uh, chelated RNA, chelated magnesium uh, that's directly bound. But then uh, we observed a third population of magnesium, uh, which is strongly coupled to the RNA, um, but it's not fully free to diffuse and also it's not chelated either. Uh, so these are outer sphere magnesiums that are fully hexahydrated, uh, but they are strongly interacting with the RNA. So they tend to hop from site to site in the core of the aptomer. So this is a sort of third population that we identified as being important for this particular RNA aptomer. And we found that as this is that most of the ions are, are doing this, or most of the magnesiums are hopping hopping around from site to site. And if you watch this movie carefully and follow a single green magnesium in the core, you can see they kind of stay bound for a while and then they hop around and then and fly out and then a new one comes in and so forth. Um, so we think that this population helps uh, glue the RNA together, but it's not chelated. So it's not like a covalent bond. It's not, or, you know, like an ionic bond. It's just, um, it's kind of a nonspecific kind of glue that ho holds things together. And so if we look at uh, radial distribution functions, um, we can, we have just that one chelated ion, but then most are the red population of outer sphere. And then we have um, diffuse. And then we, we, we distinguish the other, the others between diffuse and free, meaning if they, if they were, um, you know, slightly affected by the RNA, we call those um, diffuse. And if they were unaffected, we call those uh, free. So that was the main outcome. But what I wanted to highlight here was our the ion protocol and and that how it gives pretty nice stable RNA trajectories. Okay, so then uh, so we've applied the same protocol to uh, the E. coli seventy uh, S ribosome and uh, and we have a paper and a different Jacks paper in twenty ten and then a Plaz paper in twenty thirteen and we have some new stuff coming soon. Uh, and this is a one microsecond trajectory um, done by Paul Whitford, who's now a faculty at Northeastern. And this is when he was a postdoc in my group. And here um, we're looking at, you could see the ion distribution of potassium chloride, magnesium chloride. And then uh, you can see how nice and stable we have these ribosome trajectories. And then I'm highlighting like here, we're looking at the L7, L12 stock. The pink is L7, L12 proteins and the dark magenta purple is the RNA of that L7 stock, L7, L12 stock. But th there's a few regions around the ribosome that single molecule FRED is shown to be highly, highly dynamic. And that we see the two stocks on the right side in the purple and the very left side in the purple. But um, but the rest is is quite stable. So we see great Watson-Crick base pairs uh, and all the active sites, may, namely where the tRNA interacts with the ribosome are really uh, solid. So, um, so we believe that uh, the protocol wor works pretty well. And this is done with old Amber 99 force field. Uh, so even with the old force fields, these things are working fine if you do the ions correctly. Uh, out to, to microsecond time scale or maybe 10 microsecond time scale. Okay, so that was explicit solvent of ribosome and ribosome. And then the last study I wanted to highlight was something we published in, back in 2006 and also 2009, which is doing replica exchange molecular dynamics uh, on just in the active site of the ribosome, A site of the ribosome. And here we're looking at drug binding 
uh, and in, uh, we looked at gentamicin and a few of the aminoglycosides uh, binding to the A site, and they bind inside this. What happens is the, there's an A site helix, and two of the critical reading head bases flip out of the helix to read the codon anticodon, and the antibiotics bind inside the helix after they flip out and lock it. it it's kind of a conformational collection where maybe they're flipping out and the antibiotic gets in there and jams it. But what I wanted to highlight here is that with Repo Exchange, you know, you get uh, almost exhaustive sampling, Boltzmann sampling. And um, and so for this run, uh, which was 15 microsecond aggregate back in 2009, so just quite a big calculation for 14 years ago, and explicit solvent, and we can see the um, drug, you know, non-specifically sampling the, the region. Um, and we see it go out, flip around, and go back in and flip around, and it, it often ends up in the correct uh, binding site, depending on the replica you're looking at. And then from this, you get the full um, thermodynamics. We originally um, implemented this technique in replica exchange in 2002 for protein folding, and then we applied it to ribosomes. Here, we we restrained the ends of that decoding helix, uh, but um, but it allowed us to look at um, the dynamics of the drug near the and in the binding site and, and get ideas about the interplay between entropy and enthalpy in binding. Okay, so that is, that's all I have on explicit solvent. And now um, I want to talk to about the next native section. Yeah, yeah, sure, I can sure. ask a quick yeah. question. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious, you, you mentioned how important box size as well as kind of the cutoff yeah. distances were. Um, what type of errors do you see uh, when box size is too small or, or cutoff distance is too small? Uh, th that I haven't tested myself, but I would say that um, uh, we we tried to go out, uh, we try to keep it increasing the box size until we have convergence in the, the for example, in the electrostatic energy. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we, we might see different initial conditions give give pretty different results results uh, for electrostatic energy, but I have to say um, I haven't done the the experiment of going may, going so small that it breaks and seeing what goes wrong. Um, that would be a great paper to do for sure. That's a great question. Often for these ribosome runs, we're going out overly too big because we're always trying to notch up a new record for the biggest number of atoms, so we, we often have to way more atoms than we need for ribosomes. For riboswitches, we um, usually the the postdocs are conservative, so they go to a pretty hundred angstroms for SAM one is pretty. It's kind of more than you really need, I think. But but yeah. Okay. Any other uh, questions? There is one in the chat, um, which I can yes. uh, read out if. Uh, the person. Yeah, please, it. please. Um, the magnesium ions can momentarily change the shape of the RNA strand. Um, so how I guess rephrasing this, how important are the magnesium ions for for the actual confirmation of RNA? Yeah, that that's um that's also something we haven't really made those plots. That's a great thing to look at. But we see just visually, we do we see that happening where. Um, like in that paper in that movie I just showed about the decoding center and the antibiotic. We would see something interested where you would see a little distortion in the backbone, and there was one magnesium that was kind of hopping along and fixing the the backbone and getting it back just by itself. It would hop from site to site, and when it interact for a while, then the backbone would start relaxing to a regular a form helix dihedral. So, um, but yeah, for sure, um, we see the the magnesiums. Uh, we we think like for SAM one that they help glue P two and P three for example or um or we're doing a new paper on um the DG uh D um two prime DG ribo switch and there we have three helices and we see that magnesium kind of help help stabilize the P two to P three interactions but it's a great point. Okay, was that it from the chat? Yep, that's yeah. it. From okay, the great. Yeah. Okay, all right. My, so my, now I'll move on to the my... yes, one more. Yeah, yeah please. So sure. I'm only familiar with replica exchange in the context of Monte Carlo simulations. How 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 does it work okay. for, for MD? Yeah, in in MD. Um, so in um, two thousand two. Um, let's see, in two thousand. 
I think in actually in 1999, I think Yuji Sugita and Akamoto published the MD of Replica Exchange in Implicit Solvent. And then 2002, we published on Replica Exchange for Explicit Solvent MD. And there, um, what you do is you run um, a, a distribution of molecular dynamic simulations, all the same apart from their temperature. And then uh, every so often you swap temperatures between neighboring uh, MD simulations. Um, so you take an MD simulation, say in the configuration for 300 and you swap it with MD simulation in a configuration for 301 uh, and is Calvin. Is it probabilistic um, or, or deterministic? It's, it's with Monte Carlo criteria. Um, so it's, it's molecular dynamic simulations, but that little swap you do every once in a while yeah. is Monte Carlo criteria. And then, and you get great uh, Boltzmann sampling, pro provided that you have enough replicas. So the key thing there is the replicas, we first started doing them evenly distributed in temperature, but really close together. And then we got plenty of swapping and then you get kind of a great, um, po everything's populated. But then there's a few papers that came out maybe five years later where they were looking at the minimum replica number of replicas you need to get good amount of swapping. And then if it's this kind of an exponential distribution, you still can have sparse replicas, but but yeah, it, it works what really good. Work um, but the problem with, yeah. And for example, what is the range of temperatures between the 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 the, the, the lowest? Yeah, the, yeah, so, so it's in the highest. Um, there it depends on the system and it has to be bigger for larger systems. So that ribosome movie I showed was just for one helix actually. Um, so of, of like 10 base pairs. Um, so there, I think the range, that was in 2009, so I forgot, but I think it was around 100 Kelvin maybe, or maybe a little yeah. smaller. Um, but uh, but you have to look it up. Don't quote me on that. That was a long time ago. It was something like that. No, no, but, I... but for sure, if you, but you can't, we, of course we thought we wanted to do this for the whole ribosome, but um, the, the compute requirements exponentiate because you need then the thousands of replicas at a giant temperature range and you have to run it for long. So instead, um, another method is Hamiltonian replica, which also um, Akimoto is one of the main pioneers of that. He, his version though is called Royce, R-E-U-S, I think it's replica exchange umbrella sampling. And there, instead of um, bumping the systems with temperature, you actually um, kind of lower the Hamiltonian energy. You know, it's it's a, it's a little bit like meta dynamics, but in a replica, uh, it with you know like a distribution of MD simulations instead, uh, at different values of that bump to the to the wells and everything. Um, so so there you don't have you don't really melt the system as much as you do with temperature, um, but there are a lot of ways to do the sampling. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, other, other questions? Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to push ahead with the native uh, contact MD simulations. And there's another part of the talk, which is cryo-EM. So I'll try to hit all the three parts. So the first part's finished. Okay, so native contact simulations. This is a method, uh, as far as my historical research goes, was originated by uh, Nobuhiro Go in Japan. Uh, and and most people think of, or certainly my, people in my generation think of Go models as uh, on a lattice because uh, Nobuhiro Go did things on a lattice. Um, so there, they were, these are some of the first protein folding simulations where it was, um, uh, you, you just had a polymer on this that could only move from lattice point to lattice point and they were trying to get sampling and they would have say, some beads could be hydrophobic and some beads are polar, these HP models and they were trying to learn about protein folding. And then, you, then came the off lattice uh, people who just modeled it in regular 3D space and then uh, finally, um, Jose Onuchik at Rice was one of the first people to do um, all atom atomistic Go models uh, that he calls structure-based models. And we've collaborated with him on this since since 20, 2009 or 2010 um, on the all atom Go models. And, and then in about 2015 or so, we've put electrostatics in them and magnesium ions. Uh, and so the, the main um, idea is that if you have your MD potential, uh, that the native contacts are programmed into the potential. So it's kind of a system specific uh, force field, but it's transferable in the sense that we have a website called Smog and you can upload your PDB 
and then download parameters to run in Gromax. So, um, so it's transferable in the sense that you can do it for any any protein or any RNA by uploading and downloading uh, parameters. Um, so, so the uh, force field parameters are specific. So if you have a cryo-EM structure, uh, then the native contacts from that EM structure are hardwired into the force field, uh, namely the uh, the spring constants and the or sorry, namely the um, zero points for the for the bonds, angles, and dihedrals. Um, and then we have a lot of papers on this, mostly with Onu Chick uh, on Sam Riboswitch and on uh, the ribosome, and also also on a few. Uh, proteins such as the live BP protein and a few others. And so the, the main idea here is that if you think of a team of skydivers jumping out of a plane above Chicago, um, you can think right after they jump out of the plane, they kind of have initial random interactions with each other, but they have programmed into them a native partner. And when they find the partner that's, that's the native one, then they lock arms and they don't let go. And then after a certain time, they accumulate, the system accumulates more and more of those native arm, arm locking events. And you're able to get these um, structures forming that were programmed in from the beginning. Uh, so it's sort of a stochastic, it has stochastic sampling, but you're guaranteed to get your, your native contact in the end. And then in the simulations, um, there's temperature. So the native contacts don't always fully stick. Some, they can break if it's at high enough temperature but on average they stick. Um, so the idea is that each contact has a native partner programmed in from the cryo-EM structure. And then as a function of time, you can watch the structure uh, fold. And so for example, this was a run from 2009 on SAM1 riboswitch where we were looking at ligand binding. So we started our system in a box with a fully disordered RNA. And then as a function of time, um, when one of the ligands hits the binding site by accident, then it sticks. And then also you can look at the base pairs. When they hit the native base pair, they stick. And then uh, as a function of time, you see more and more um, native contacts form until eventually you, you see all the native contacts form. And everyone asks, what about non-native? So, um, so we have electrostatics in this now uh, with magnesium and those, uh, are non-native because uh, uh, any nucleotide can interact with any other nucleotide electrostatically. But we're also now the latest thing we're trying to do is program in non-Watson-Crick base pairs or Watson-Crick base pairs that aren't in the cryo-EM structure. So we're working hard on trying to emulate, for example, trapping that happens in some of the introns and so forth, kinetic traps. Okay, so this is the basic idea of the native contact uh, potentials. And yeah, and and we have added in um, uh, implicit uh, potassium chloride, and ex and we put explicit uh, magnesium, and we have some papers on that in Biophysical Journal, also PhysRev letters uh, a year later. Okay, uh, and then we valid for electrostatics. We validated um, against uh, some of these uh, preferential interaction coefficients, where you have HQS quenching that were performed um, in, uh, by David Draper's group at John Hopkins a while ago. And we, we can see reasonable agreement uh, there for the case of the adenine riboswitch. And then also we try to kind of cross-validate against explicit solvent runs, our, our own SAM1 explicit solvent runs. For example, looking at preferential interaction coefficient on the Y and magnesium concentration on the X. And here we did a lot of different magnesium concentrations to try to get these curves correct. Okay, and then for full ribosome, uh, we can look at uh, comparing explicit solvent against these native contact or structure-based models. And for example, we can compare RMSD uh, to try to try to get those uh, matching. And then on for full ribosome, um, here this is a fully unrestrained uh, system in that it's fully stochastic. Uh, and there, so there's no targeting or targeted MD or anything like that here. So the system's uh, uh, allowed to do spontaneous fluctuations. And the way we do these, so I should mention that the first movies I showed of the RNA folding 
there you start with a disordered RNA and you program in the final folded state. Here, we have a transition from A to B. We start the system in state A, but we program in state B. And then also we have some newer papers uh, like in NAR, I think in 2019 uh, of RIBA switches where we have a dual basin, where we have two native contact basins and we can look at the transitions back and forth in a more thermodynamic way. But here you still can get pretty good energy landscapes out of these kinds of runs. And this is for the any ribosome aficionados, this is a cognate DRNA moving from the A state, AT state to the AA state. And we have a new paper out that came out a few months ago uh, where we're looking at cognate versus near cognate. Um, so here is the cognate case. Also, we now have the EFTU factor and we look and look at the accommodation or the movement from that partially bound AT state to the fully bound AA state. And, and we can look in, in more detail about what some of these pathways um, might look like uh, as the, the tRNA accommodates in. And we can look at different landscapes. So we can look at, for example, on the y-axis, uh, the distance between the elbow, one tRNA elbow to the elbow, which kind of shows if it's uh, partially bound or fully bound. And then we can look at the codon, anti-codon is it, if the really uh, close interactions are being formed, base pair interactions are be formed, being formed at A site. Uh, and we can kind of track the pathway that the tRNA follows for the cognate tRNA. And then we also looked at uh, near cognate, which is when the base pairs between the tRNA and the mRNA have a mismatch and see, and, and we see, uh, different pathways happening in, in this case, within the context of this native contact uh, model. Uh, and then we also have non-productive ones where it just doesn't ever fully accommodate and then it falls off. Uh, and so we, so the, the take home of this uh, paper was that we got different pathways for cognate and, and near cognate and the energy landscapes. Again, this is tracking the elbow to elbow distance. So it starts, with this pre-AT uh, configuration and the cognate, it kind of, the co we see the codon anti-codon forming and then the um, elbow moving in. But then in some cases for the near cognate, we see uh, the elbow moving uh, significantly in first before the, the codon anti-codon interaction forms. Uh, and then we can do different histograms and we have a, a hypothesis about misalignment, where if it's misaligned at one end, it's misaligned at the other end and so forth. Uh, okay, so the last part of the talk, um, I'm almost at the end of time now, um, so I'll just try to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, but first of all, were there any questions on the native contact uh, potentials? Anything in the chat? No, okay. No, no, no. There's oh, what, someone? Yeah. No, 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 there's okay. nothing. So yeah, we can move on. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so we we have so we've used these native contacts to try to do um, fitting of cryo EM maps, and we started on this in two thousand nine, uh, right around when we started uh, doing the native contact simulations, uh, and uh, and we followed up uh, Klaus Scholten and Joachim Frank's um, work with MDFF and NAMD where they had explicit solvent runs back in like 2007, I think they published. Uh, uh, so there they were running MD simulations biased by the cryo-EM force field. But there you had the, especially they're, they're also working on ribosomes. So you have to use a whole cluster to do those fits, like a big cluster, like hundred or several hundred nodes. Uh, and then, uh, so we wanted to enable users to do it faster. So we have a desktop solution uh, that we developed back in 2010, and then in 2018-19, we put we worked together with the Phoenix team, and we have it in Phoenix now, although it's still kind of in the beta beta version, and we call it Phoenix .cryofit. And so, so typically for fitting with molecular simulations, uh, if you're trying to uh, make an RNA or RNP that will uh, be consistent with cryoEM for ribosomes, you often have the uh, you have a full atomistic 
model in one species and then they you solve the density in another species in a different conformation. So first, uh, a homology model can be made. Um, and we have some papers doing this, but I'm not talking about homology modeling today. Um, but then once you have your atomistic uh, model, the next task is to fit it into the correct conformation that matches the uh, cryo-EM. And uh, one of the benefits of this uh, strategy is that uh, if you suppose you're doing your cryo-EM and you, you solve the system like the ribosome in five different configurations that are very different from each other, um, that's why you don't have to redo modeling like in Coot or something over and over and over again, um, but you can just morph from one, morph meaning fully stochastic MD simulations from one uh, state to the other state each time without having to redo the model nucleotide by nucleotide. <clears throat> so the concept is, that I'm going to talk about today is that if you have your map in green and you have a you already have an atomistic model done for that secondary structure and you have it some 3D configuration, then we run some kind of MD to get it the, to change the configuration to get it consistent with the map. Uh, and one of the first groups working on this uh, was also Klaus Schulten and Charlie Brooks and uh, Florence Tama in 2003, where they were doing uh, normal mode flexible fitting. And then also Klaus Schulten with uh, Shale at UCSF uh, did some real space refinement in a different cell paper. And then Klaus Schulten and Joachim Frank and Elizabeth Villa did uh, molecular dynamics flexible fit in 2007. And then we came out with MD fit in 2010, which wasn't really proper software. It was more of a method. And then um, and then in 2017, 2018, and now like a whole zoology came out of different methods to fit uh, cryo-EM since cryo-EM took off. Because cryo-EM has been around since like the 80s, but it only got to high resolution around 2013. Um, and so so then everyone jumped on the bandwagon is making a lot of different fitting uh, techniques. Like my colleague Yuji Sugita has Ensemble MD, which uses kind of replica exchange to do the fits. But there it's like a huge cluster you need um and then and so ours um we can run on the desktop and still do something like ribosome or bigger which is cryofit uh and so here um the idea is that uh we use a uh native contact potential is the main thing that's different from ours and the other methods that i was talking about with the skydivers and everything and then lambda three you have a cryo EM term. I don't think I put the side in here, but the cryo EM term is uh, what you do is uh, as you're running the simulation, you compute a simulated map of your system. And this is often the bottleneck, and people are working on fast ways to do that. But you compute a simulated map of your system, 3D volume map, and then you calculate a correlation between that map and the actual cryo EM map. And then uh, from there, that and that goes in your MD potential. So that biases your uh, the potential and the forces and everything. Um, we also have when when so originally our MD fit program only had lambda one and lambda three. And then when the high resolution stuff came out in 2013, we added lambda two, which we do have an implicit solvent um, normal force field in there as well. But but we run it everything without water. So it runs pretty fast, but because it's uh, the native contacts in there, these, those really guarantee good stereochemistry. Uh, and so, um, but, but the Lambda 2 allows us if there is, if there are rearrangements that happen, like a certain helix might um, unravel, it's supposed to unravel a little bit that, that we can handle now with that term. Okay. Uh, this I won't go over. It's a long story about scuba diving, but, uh, I can tell it, save it for another day. Uh, but uh, so, um, uh, so, so what some of these look like, this is with the native contacts only from 2010. And you can see in the middle, this blue tRNA um, does like a 70 angstrom conformational change. And for something like a lot of the cryo -EM people, you know, they use real space refinement also in Phoenix, but there you can also really only get like five angstrom, maybe 10 angstrom change in the RMS. But with the native contact potentials, you can really do huge conformational changes, but still get very good um, stereochemistry. So you're watching on the middle of the screen, you can see the cyan colored tRNA 
do do this very large motion from one state to the other state. And we do this in an iterative way where this actually was a relatively higher resolution map, but we smooth it ourselves first. We smooth out all the detail and we run a, a kind of overall run first. And then we go with a lesser smooth trajectory here to get more of the detail. And then finally we do it the third time with the real map to refine it more. Um, and and so that, that was that system. We also, um, this is one of the movies I forgot to replace. Okay, so it's not running, but we also have this on the mammalian uh, uh, rabbit ribosome. Oh no, it's there, great, it's there, okay, good. Um, so here is our result using the same method for eukaryotic uh, ribosome as well. You see you get quite, quite pretty good fit there. And then here's, um, you can see in more detail uh, for our high resolution method, cryofit and Phoenix, where we're looking at just the tRNA. This is one of our benchmarks. And, and the way in practice this is run, we have it on GitHub in the beta called cryofit for Phoenix. And um, uh, in practice we run this, but then we still run real space refine after to get, to get the um, Ramachandran and get it so you can submit it to PDB. But but this really gives some big conformational changes that you can't really get with real space refine. Um, here's another case of uh, yeast or sorry human ribosome small subunit where if you look at the left edge where the arrows are you can see after we get we get the helices fitting in pretty nicely for these higher resolution maps. And then finally this is um, what I had on my title slide. Uh, where we're just doing one of the stocks of the large subunit. This is one of our early benchmarks. And um, so here, uh, this is one of the, the fits we have where you can see the bases um, outlined a little more clearly than some of the other ones. And again, once we, this gives us kind of a rough fit and then you can run real space refinement to really uh, tweak it in, inside Phoenix. Okay, so that's it, I'm done. Um, so uh, the main take homes are that uh, we have this cryofit module in Phoenix that um, uses the native contacts so you can run like a full ribosome on a desktop. And then the native contact potential allows um, spontaneous long time scale uh, transitions while doing a pretty good job to preserve standard chemistry. So 10 to 100 milliseconds. And one of our new papers we had out with the main take home was that near cognates take alternative pathways for ribosomes. And then I would like to thank everyone who did the work. Um, so Andrea Viana was one of my early postdocs who did the replica. Um, Serdal Kamrizi Alton really um, uh, took our algorithm into Phoenix. Um, and then uh, Paul did a lot of the native contact things. Dylan um, got our own wet lab query I'm going at Los Alamos and did a lot of the work. And then our newest poach stock is um, Jignesh, who's doing all our stuff now. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have some questions in the chat. So maybe I will start from Conan. What's the score function for cryofit? Teresa, you're still muted. Okay, so the scoring function is that we have several scoring functions. The main one is the correlation uh, between the simulated map and the actual map. And we have three different correlation functions. We mainly use the, uh, well, we have a few papers out in the last few years. During the run, the box, uh, correlation uh, function is used uh, during during in the actual potential, but there are three different um, correlations that we use to score it in the end to evaluate how we're doing against other uh, methods. And you can check our um, we have a J JCIM paper on that. Okay, Anush. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, Carissa. Great talk, like always. Uh, I have several related questions about the use of restraints. So first of all, yeah. I mean, you use, you restrain your system a lot. I mean, most of the simulations with different types of restraints. So one question is, 
um, do you do, do you evaluate the importance of these restraints in any way? Like, for instance, do a bootstrap, like, for instance, trying only a subset of restraints versus, you know, not yeah. using some of the others. Uh, what is your thought about, you know, finding like a minimal set of restraints that actually reproduce the uh, biological yeah. meaning of the, of the system? And, and, and what would happen if you, you know, if you have a, like a negative control, like if you run the simulation without any restraints, what happens? I'm sure it would, you know, it, I, I know how it would look like, but what you can gather from, you know, like removing the restraints and finding what happens. That's yeah. one, okay. that's one question. The second. Okay, can I address that? Can I address that one first? Because sure. there were three questions in that I, I, one. But I so had, but I, yeah, but I had, I had okay. well, I want... they related. Okay, so the second is actually what happens. Well, I, I, I don't think I don't think I can remember all the questions, but uh, I don't think I'll remember all the first questions. So all oh, right, okay. Can I okay. first answer right. the first okay. questions? Okay, okay. Sure, sure, okay. Sure. But it's good to see you, Giannis. Uh, great to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, so on restraints, um, uh, the. I want I want to emphasize that the first part of the talk of explicit solvent, those were done all restraint free without any restraints whatsoever. So a lot of the ion protocols were up to the point before we actually did the, the production runs we're publishing. So um, we applied a lot of restraints to get the system ready, and then we let it free without any restraints whatsoever for the 70S run I showed of microsecond, and also the SAM1 ribos, which had absolutely no restraints whatsoever. And those are good controls to, to go unrestrained. And then the um, native contact or structure-based models, those also are unrestrained in the sense that uh, there's no restraint or constraint applied, but they have a native, the, the force field is a different kind of force field, but, there, but there's no restraint in there. Um, for cryorium, there's tons of restraints, um, like you're saying. Um, so for their, uh, the main the main restraint is the the EM map bias. I would say if you if you want to call that a, a restraint, um, and so uh, so I would say in that case um, we we haven't done a lot of comparing uh, the the unfit uh, dynamics to the fitting dynamics. I guess so. We, so we could do that. Um, I don't know if that's really addressing your question of the the, the question though. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. It, it, thank you. I mean, it does answer part of my question. What I'm really interested in is that you know, to yeah. which extent actually the the paucity of restraints uh, affects yes. the quality of the outcome. And the the, the second question that that uh, I have not asked yet was about the bad restraints. To which uh, to, to which extent the your overall simulation system yeah. is yeah. resistant. To some bad restraints. I mean, the literature knows that. Yeah. I mean, sometimes the systems are perfect if the restraints are good. That yeah, is, the yeah. one bad restraints, everything is just goes to hell. And you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. to which extent your system is, you know, is is resistant, is resistant to go south. Yeah. Uh, if, you know, if, if you if you have some bad restraints. Yeah. 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 This is a great question, and um, I should say, let me clean up my first answer, and that. Um, the first two simulations were fully unrestrained, the 70s and SAM1, but the third explicit solvent one I showed on the replica, I put that in at the last minute before the talk um, that we published in 2009, that did have the ends of the helix restrained. It was just one little helix, but it was restrained to be in the ribosome. So that we didn't do the control of running full ribosome, which which we should do, I think. Um, and then to, your, to this question, um, in the Go model, the, the native contact models, uh, you know, the advantage is that they, uh, you know, for example, if you're going from a state A to state B, um, state B, basically we program in the, all the native contacts that are, uh, uh, well, well let, let, me, let me say this again. If, if we're doing cryo fit, uh, if we're fitting cryo EM, uh, there we have state A only. Uh, but we're biasing the system with the cryo -EM map. Um, so it preserves all the state, the stereochemistry in state A, um, and then it kind of flexes anything that needs to change. So if there are rearrangements that need to be made, like for example, a uh, base pair exchange from one base to, to a different base, um, that we can manage because we now have the the um, ab initio force fields in there, but we kind of have to tune it tune it by hand. And so it's kind of these hinge 
Uh, ba basically, the method can get overall conformational changes of a big motion, but if there's any breaking at the hinge point or something, uh, it's not so good for that. So, th so that needs work there, I think. D does that... Hey. Yeah, to, you. Does that address it? Okay. Yeah. Basically, it's the breaking points. Um, the the method is not that great at. I'd say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. In the chat, there's a couple of practical yeah. questions on CrowFit. I'm going to try okay. to put together. Okay. Um. So when uh doing J five was having problems with Crow's uh fit distorting secondary structure mm -hmm. and wondering um whether there's parameters that need to be set. And then Michael had a question about um using cryofit for, I guess, lower resolution, like four angstroms where you cannot see distinct yeah. phase density. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so the first question, um, distorting RNA secondary structure. Uh, so there, um, I'd, it'd be great to know your specific uh, system. Uh, so there, um, what we're, we're actually putting in, I should say that's like, our original instance of this method was we called MD fit uh, that you can still download. Um, and there, what we do is we add and subtract contacts by hand if we know which ones are supposed to break, for example, when you're doing a transition. Um, and we're right now we're putting that capability into the Phoenix version. That, that's something we're doing right now. We should have it done uh, by the new year, I think. Uh, but please um, email me and I can put you in contact with Jignesh, whose picture is in the upper left corner. And we have a new programmer uh, called Li Wei Hung, who's also helping us. Um, and basically there, I think if you um, adjust the contacts by hand and in the problem areas, then, then it should resolve your issue. But but please send an email and we'll uh, I'll put you in touch with the right people. And then the question about low resolution, this method was actually made for... Um, 10 angstrom or eight angstrom. Um, so that's our sweet spot, I'd say. So it's really good at four angstrom, five angstrom, six angstrom, eight angstrom, 10 angstrom, 15 angstrom. Um, and we're trying to get it good for high resolution, which it's okay that, but um, but yeah, no problem at all going for low resolution. All right, um, a question from Conan about CryoFit and actually the implementation. Um, why is it faster than than the previous methods? What advances did you make to increase efficiency? Uh, yeah, so the basic advance is that we don't have to have water. So like MDFF, and there's also another method is Solde that's in um, Chimera X, um, need uh, explicit solvent. So there you get a tenfold speed up there and then going to the native contact you also get to five or ten full speed up from there as well so th those were those were the main uh, changes i have one question about actually yeah. crowd fit potential um is it directional in any way um so is there like a directional gradient mm -hmm. that tells it where to move for example, that tRNA looked like it was very nicely going towards the density. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and in that simulation, we did not have any um, uh, direction added to it. Basically, like the dihedrals, uh, kind of were. It, um, we should say though, in in that one, um, uh, the we had to tune up, turn up the cryo map force basically. So we kind of play with the how high the cryo-m force is. Um, but we've added directionality now. So that's one of the new features that we'll see in 2024, where we have, you can put a sphere somewhere, and then we have a steered MD that we've added now that will um, pull whatever region you want. It could be the whole molecule or region, and then pull it toward that sphere, the center of mass to center of mass. Uh, yeah. All right, we're almost coming upon nine. Is there a final question from anyone in the audience? Oh, if maybe I will ask one. So you showed, uh, I mean, different setups for simulations, but is it still needed to have like supercomputer or you see that in the future it will be easier for people to run this uh, molecule simulations or I don't know if laptop, but uh, regular PCs? You still need a super, I... very powerful computer for simulations? 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. We're actually struggling with that because we have a supercomputer, but, but um, nothing, there's no MD codes, Gromax or NAMD or anything that we know of that will scale on GPU as well. You know, past, by well, I mean past 50 nodes maybe um, at, at 80% efficiency. So we're running on, we're forced to run on single nodes a lot now. Um, so we can, they can handle it if you get a really expensive GPU server. Um, we're running a big membrane system of two and a half million atoms now. Um, so yeah, you can you can run these big ones on a big GPU right now. Absolutely, I think. But but it's an open problem in the field now. I think to get to get we'd like to run those out to like hundred milliseconds though. Which if we could leverage all the GPUs, we could get there. But nothing is scaling, so that's a, that's a big issue I think in the field. Okay, thank you. All right, well, we'll close the session. Thank you so much um, for your wonderful Okay, time. thanks so much for the invite and all the great questions. All right, Thank see everyone in two weeks. weeks.